Okay, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Josh Jacobs from the LGO office. I'm delighted to welcome you to our web seminar today with Jim Miller. Jim is LFM at that time, uh, class of 1993, and he's the Vice President of Worldwide Operations for Google. Um, just a little bit of background about Jim. Uh, before Google, he held senior roles in uh, a range of companies in the clean tech and IT sectors. Uh, he was executive vice president of San Mina SCI Corporation, one of the world's largest EMS providers. Before that, he was a founder and principal at a consulting firm focusing on corporate and ops strategy for alternate energy companies called um, Sierra Crest Consulting. And before that, was executive vice president of supply chain product management at First Solar. And before that, held prominent roles with Cisco, Amazon.com, IBM, Intel, uh, and so obviously has really uh, played a, a part in many of the important IT developments over the past few years. Um, really excited to have Jim on the call today. Uh, Jim, can I ask, are you interested in entertaining questions along the way, or do you want to wait till the end? Let's wait until the end. Okay, uh, great. Everyone is going to be muted on entry, so uh, why don't you just send me a chat uh, along the way, if you have a question you'd like to ask at the end, and I'll make sure to put you in the queue. And Jim, take it away. And we've got just a time check. We've got an hour, right? That's right. Good. All right. So as I see people signing in, I see uh, many friends from LFM past and uh, even careers past. So welcome. For those of you that uh, I've not met, I uh, certainly hope to get that opportunity in the future. So. Um, uh, Josh, thanks for the great uh, introduction, and with that, I'll jump right into it. Um, so, I couldn't start this presentation without talking about Google's mission, and that that, that really puts the, what what I do and in, in, and our team does in the context of uh, the whole presentation. So, you know, our our Google's mission is really to organize all the world's information and, and make it accessible and useful and usable as possible, and and quite frankly, that, that really is the guiding mantra for just about everything we do. And it's, it's really amazing in the last few years with the proliferation and literal explosion of things like smartphones and now tablets, um, you know, uh, e-books, everything. The world's obviously moving more and more uh, to a digital world and where ubiquity and accessibility is, uh, is universal. And that's obviously not only having a, a change on the way that we uh, live and play and, and work, but also, uh, as we've seen in the Middle East, that's having a profound impact on geopolitics today, uh, probably much more so than any of us could have anticipated even just probably a year ago. Um, I have to put this in as a prologue. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, but um, quite frankly, this was a question that went through my mind, and it might be going through your mind, um, when I got a call from the Google recruiting team in the fall of 2009. So why in the world would a software company like Google need somebody who spent probably much more time uh, in their career doing hardware-related uh, activity um, than software? And that started a eight-month interview quest of uh, finding that out, which obviously culminated in me coming here. Um, and I think the best way to put it in perspective is just to talk about Google and our scale of what we do. And I think that will paint the uh, mosaic for why, in fact, they might need somebody who's uh, fairly hardware-centric. So first of all, Google, its, its foundation, its very history, its gestation is all about search. Um, you know, we do about a billion searches a day. And what's pretty interesting is that, you know, we do that in now today with Google Instant, Instant Search, we do that real time. And interestingly enough, it's just a side venue uh, or side comment. To really do Google Instant, we had to create a new memory architecture and hierarchy that didn't exist in the market and actually develop, deploy, and uh, convert over our entire search uh, uh, architecture to that new memory. So uh, massive scale worldwide, uh, and that's got some interesting challenges to it. Um, Android. So we are the number one uh, phone OS in the world, uh, and we continue to gain momentum. Uh, this is a bit dated, but we were at about 300,000 activations per day 
Uh, I just saw an announcement this morning that HTC announced a tripling of profits, primarily on the, uh, the backs of the success of Android phones. And uh, all of these numbers are quite frankly dated. Uh, the, uh, we continue to gain and accelerate our momentum in, in Android phones. And uh, those of you that are probably uh, in the, the uh, uh, shopping around for technology, although the iPad 2 certainly has made, and, and all credit to Apple, they've done a phenomenal job with tablets, uh, Honeycomb and uh, the proliferation of those tablets. Uh, is continuing to uh, to gain uh, momentum as well, and we expect uh, similar success uh, in the coming months and quarters with uh, with our tablets as well. YouTube. So we have a massive infrastructure to serve video. Um, Two billion videos are served a day. Uh, Thirty-five hours of video uploaded uh, every hour, which makes an interesting math problem. There's more more video on YouTube than uh, than is possible to be actually viewed, uh, which makes a very interesting challenge from a storage and, and distribution standpoint. But also, uh, we made an announcement yesterday that we are moving uh, YouTube more and more into uh, premium video, and that's certainly in the anticipation that uh, we'll continue to see the traditional format of TV proliferate onto the web. And then our current browser, 120 million active users, uh, it's the fastest growing browser in the world and continues to uh, gain momentum as well. And uh, Google Inc., uh, you know, we are a company that, quite frankly, is uh, making most of its revenue today off of advertising. And uh, not only do we have a multiple, you know, tens of billions of dollars of revenue stream, but we enable a lot of, uh, and this is just U.S. web-based commerce, um, uh, through our ad uh, platform and our uh, ad market as well. So uh, just, you know, don't want to go into this in a lot of detail, but that's uh, really uh, one of the uh, interesting things about Google. So it is all about scale. Um, our infrastructure deployment and management is actually a core competency and competitive advantage of the company, uh, particularly as we start to move into things like cloud computing. Uh, and you'll certainly see more activity in that space uh, in the coming quarter. Uh, but this does give us a tremendous advantage to reach the uh, uh, the world and do it in a very cost competitive way. Um, this is something that's somewhat unique about Google. Our software platform and our hardware platform are pretty much inextricably linked. And by that I mean we can't make a change to our software platform without it impacting the hardware. The hardware, pardon me, in in some interesting way. So. Uh, my group's job is, is, quite frankly, not to build widgets, but it is a tight coupling with our service and our product groups to actually co-design software platforms and hardware platforms. A perfect example of being around Instant Search. Instant Search is as much a hardware in, uh, manifestation as it is a software manifestation. So that makes some interesting uh, operational challenges, but quite frankly, it's also what makes the job a lot of fun. Um, this just, just gives you another data point around the scale. So on any given day, about a tenth of the world's internet traffic goes over uh, the Google infrastructure. Uh, so we have a massive scale to serve globally, and that takes the form of many different uh, and interesting uh, hardware and software uh, instantiations around the globe. Um, we never do anything small. So when we talk about a product launch, we actually talk about a TAM, a total available market, of billions of people. So the vernacular that we use, most of us you know, talk about gigabytes and, and terabytes at home for things like storage and, and uh, RAM and, and flash, but most of our conversations at Google involve petabytes and exabytes. Uh, and you know, we, we are a huge benefactor of Moore's Law, and we use that to our advantage, both from a cost deployment and uh, scale perspective. We spend a lot of Google's dollars, and I can't tell you how much, um, but it is a significant uh, portion of uh, Google's annual um, income uh, is actually deployed uh, through my group. I spend most of Google's money every year. Um, so I have a nice uh, uh, regular dates with our CFO. Uh, most people don't know this, but it's actually very public. Um, you know, we uh, run our own energy company. So we are very, very active in the renewable energy space. We believe that's something that uh, 
um, is uh, paramount to the way that we run our compute platform, being carbon neutral. And uh, in fact, we I have a nice little group that buys and sells energy, and we are a commercial energy company. Uh, and probably the amount of energy that, that Google consumes, uh, a good chunk of that being green and renewable energy, um, is actually uh, sourced through uh, through my uh, group as well. And then finally, um, you know everything that we do. Uh, from running the company to uh, dog fooding, experimenting with our own uh, new products is actually done uh, through Google. So we run the whole company on, of course, Gmail uh, and use our search algorithms uh, internal uh, as well as uh, we I have a whole uh, uh, desk full of tablets and phones and my 11-year-old finds it. Uh, he loves coming here because he always has something to play with. Um, and then, you know, uh, and interestingly enough, um, I did not anticipate this when I put the presentation together. We tend to say a little bit about our operations publicly. And for some of you that follow the space, uh, one thing that happened yesterday was Facebook uh, made a very public announcement about their compute platform, and they're actually calling it the Open Compute uh, Initiative. And as you can imagine, that's generated quite a bit of buzz within uh, Google in the last 24 hours about, you know, how much should we be talking about uh, and how much should we be uh, distributing about what we do in, in compute, uh, in our compute platform. But for the time being, we still believe that it's a competitive advantage and we're doing some very, very interesting things and innovative things that, uh, in fact, we'll uh, probably continue to uh, um, uh, keep uh, private, but I'm sure that we'll get more public around what we're doing with green and renewable energy. I think that is a good story to tell. Okay, so I tried to put a presentation together that walked through the elements of Google's supply chain, and every time I wrote a bullet point down and I looked at the PowerPoint slide, I realized that, guess what, I can't talk about that um, because there is so much about our supply chain that, that uh, is, in fact, um, fairly con uh, confidential. And I'll tell you a funny story that will just put that in perspective. The day that I, uh, uh, the day before that I uh, had to accept my offer to Google, uh, there was really no job description about the job. In fact, it was just a one-liner. You know, uh, the offer letter was basically VP of Operations for Google, and you know, my wife looked at me and said, "There is absolutely no way that you can accept a senior role without knowing what your job scope is going to be." So I went out to dinner with Ors uh, Ors uh, Hosley, and Ors is em he's my boss. He's employee number eight, and he. Uh, Ors has probably touched all aspects of, of Google in some way, shape, or form. He still runs most of the uh, the key applications for Google. In addition to his, his uh, operations job, he built all the data centers. In fact, in some cases, he built the hardware himself uh, on the weekend and at night. And um, so I went to Ors and said, Ors, you know, I love Google. I think very highly of you guys. I've learned a lot through the interview process. But to be quite frank, I, I can't accept a job without a job offer. And Ors looked at me and, and kind of laughed and said, you know, we like you. You like us, obviously. And he said, unfortunately, I can't tell you much more about the job. So you're going to have to take, you're going to have to accept this job on faith that it's a really cool job and just trust me. And, uh, you know, through, fortunately, through the eight months of interviewing for Google, um, you know, I had grown to appreciate and value Ors quite a bit. And uh, I said, okay. So I went home and basically accepted this job pretty much sight unseen, not knowing what it entailed. Um, and you know there were reasons why, as I came to find out, uh, there were reasons why they couldn't tell me exactly you know what the job was all about. And you know my first week on the job, you know, I went home and said, "Wow, this is one of the coolest jobs in the world, and I can't tell anybody about it." And that's still pretty much the case. So uh, it, it is really in many ways perpetuated a great home work-life balance because I don't usually discuss most I usually don't even discuss elements of, of Google with my with my family for obvious reasons so you know I I kind of shied away from most of the supply chain stuff we can probably talk some about some of that on the periphery during the Q&A but um, so I write I said well there's I have one or two choices I can go back to Josh and say Josh I, I really can't give much of a you know, much of a talk about Google supply chain uh, and bow out, which I thought was kind of a wimpy thing to do. Or I can just start to reflect, and, and I've been doing this for quite a while, 
yeah, I've had the opportunity of, of working at some great companies for some great leaders with, with some, you know, great, uh, even great LFM peers and alum. And during that whole time, I've, you know, kind of kept a running dialogue or, or uh, notes around and quite frankly, I've tried to incorporate a lot of these lessons into the way that I run operations and I manage people and I, I manage my career. And I thought, you know, and, and I mentor a lot of people here at Google and around Silicon Valley and, and, you know, a number of my mentees have said, you know, this is great stuff. You should you should probably think about, you know, communicating it. And like most LFMs, you know, you're like me, you probably don't have a lot of time to, to sit down and, and uh, uh, write uh, papers and things like that. And I thought, hey, what what not a better opportunity to take than, than this to just share some of those observations and and uh, advice. I mean, some of you are probably just graduating or will be graduating from LFM. I, I, I know I saw some of the people jump on. You guys have been, you know, in some cases, at your careers longer than I have. Uh, but I think these are the, the pieces of advice that I've gotten from, from senior leaders, including Larry Page and Andy Grove and, and John Chambers and, and Jeff Bezos and others that I thought was, uh, you know, pretty pithy and, and things that I've lived, tried to live by. So there's nothing on this, these sheets that, that uh, I have not tried to incorporate into my own, you know, management style and, and uh, professional life. So with that, we'll jump into it and uh, hopefully you guys will take some value out of this and, and uh, we'll enjoy it. So I've broken it down into two sections, one being leadership and the next one being career management. And you know, I sent Rev1 over to Josh a couple of days ago and he came back and said, there's no way you can cover this in an hour. So what I've done is I've, uh, I've uh, cut it back significantly and, and uh, I'll be happy to send out the, uh, the Rev1 because it's got probably twice as much information. So uh, I'll offer that up to Josh and, and the uh, LGO team to follow up with. Um, yeah, this is something that this first bullet point is something that I learned from Kate Camp. Kate was the uh, head of HR for, for Cisco when I was there. And, you know, one time I asked Kate, you know, so Kate, you know, what, what is leadership to you? And she, she, you know, told this to me and I thought it was an incredibly interesting and, and pithy comment. So leadership is all about having people smarter than you and better than you actually want to follow you somewhere. And, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of, of, you know, additional meaning in this, you know, hire people better than you, um, inspire people, give them a vision. But at the end of the day, it is all, all about um, getting people that are better than you to actually want to follow you somewhere. And I look at the team that I've got at Google. It is an interesting amalgam of people that have been here almost since day one and people that have come from very traditional supply chain backgrounds from high technology. Uh, but, you know, there's one thing that, that, you know, I think about my team, you know, it is in many ways, I could not assemble a more interesting, more talented, and more diverse group of people. And we, we, we're in the process of, of continually adding to that team. But, you know, one of the things that um, is interesting is, you know, Google, we run our entire operations with about 170 people. That's basically all my group is. And what we're able to do with those 170 people is pretty phenomenal. But when I interview people and I sign off on, on every offer we make, one thing I remind them is, you know, most of you probably went to high school with graduating classes that were bigger than 170. I certainly did. And when you think about the, the opportunity cost and the premium that we put on every single individual, um, it is absolutely paramount that we hire the best and the most capable people into, our, into these jobs because they are going to be do some, doing something that maybe four or five people would be doing at, at other companies. Uh, because if you look, you know, relative to the scale and the volume that we build, we could easily justify being probably a thousand people. Uh, but that has some uh, interesting uh, effects, which uh, which I won't go into right now. Um, this is something that that you know I, I try to live by and and really. You know, whether, you know, whether you're working and, and trying to develop a group for, you know, you're managing 10 people or you're trying to, you know, manage 1,000 people, this is something that I think is, is incredibly important. You know, what legacy are you leaving? And that legacy could be on capability. It could be on uh, growing and developing people. And, you know, I, I tell my groups all the time, you know, my, 
My mantra in my, my acid test for have I done a good job of developing a senior team is can I leave for a month or two and have complete confidence that my group is going to continue to run itself. And quite frankly, when, when I left Cisco, um, now three years ago, almost to the day, um, you know, I left an organization that I thought one was better than the one that I, that I joined, um, and it was certainly more capable than the one that I joined a few years before. And at the end of the day, um, it ran fairly transparently without me. Uh, and I, would, you know, I still follow up uh, quite frequently frequently with a lot of my uh, ex-leadership team. And, you know, on one hand, you know, one would like to believe that you're irreplaceable and, and, you know, from an ego standpoint, one would like to believe that the organization can't run without you. But at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is, is in fact, create an organization that can run without you. Uh, and that, that people, you know, that, that they can fall into lockstep. And, you know, that's one thing that I've told my team at Google you know, I want to take myself out, out of the decision-making process, and I want you guys to come to me for advice. Um, I want you to come to me for counsel on some of the really tough problems, but at the end of the day, if you guys are bringing me softball pitches, you're not doing your job. Uh, if, if you're bringing, you know, problems to me that I look at you and go, you know what the answer is to this problem, or you know how to solve this problem, you don't need my help. Um, you know, I know that, that we're not, we haven't developed to the point where we need to be yet. Uh, and that's all good. That's, you know, that's the fun thing about coming to work every day and, and developing the team and the capability around that. Um, yeah, this is something I learned at Angel, from Angel Mendez when I was at Cisco. Um, you know, you put these goals out and the first reaction of your team should be, there is no possible way that we're going to be able to do that. And you know, 24 hours later, you come back and, and you know, the, the vision starts to gel around, hey, this, this is tough, but it's not impossible. And I think, you know, the, the thing with, that, that most of us work, most of us work in companies where we have an incredibly talented employee base, and they ask us to be challenged day in and day out. So um, I think that's something that, uh, uh, that, that certainly goes a long way. This is a huge one, which, quite frankly, I've developed and I continue to develop over the year, uh, over the years. You know, human beings are an interesting beast. Um, we're motivated by self-interest and, you know, collecting probably more toys and more money and more titles. But, you know, to be a great leader, I think you've got to really put your ego aside and, you know, understand that you're, that you're working for a team. And at the end of the day, if they do great things, um, good things come out of that. And I have seen more gifted young leaders and managers fail in organizations because it was all about self-promotion and optics, and they lost sight of their team. Uh, and, you know, uh, people are pretty smart. They can figure out pretty quickly if they're being BSed or if they're being uh, manipulated or used, and they act out in interesting ways. And I think the thing that, that I'm continually reminded about is um, – you know, uh, coming to work every day, realizing that what you're doing is you're trying to do something for the organization and the shareholders, and you're trying to develop your team and grow them. And, you know, Lee Scott over at, at Walmart, the ex-CEO of Walmart, says continually, you know, you know, you know praise is, kind, uh, is, the, is the currency of leaders, and the best thing to do is just give it away. And, you know, fortunately, I've been able to learn that fairly, you know, um, uh, early in my career, although I will have to be the first to admit that it was a painful and arduous journey to get there, but it's something that, that I try to live by every day. Um, Nick D'Onofrio is, is an IBMer. He's one of the top guys. Uh, he uh, really shepherded their whole uh, re-architecture of their mainframes and, and risk computing in the early days. You know, Nick, I, I've interacted with Nick quite a bit through my career, and, you know, Nick... Um, is a phenomenally gifted guy, but when you go into a meeting, um, you will never know that Nick is in that meeting because he's not a grandstander. He's not one to tell people where he went to school, what he's accomplished, what kind of accolades he's gotten, and he's got a lot. Uh, and, you know, the one thing that I've learned from, from Nick over the years is just uh, check your ego at the door. Uh, nobody cares. And I always tell us to to most of the new hires that, that come to work to me, uh, nobody cares as much about the fact that you went to MIT as you did. So, um, you know, 
uh, put that aside. Um, you know, this is something, and I can't, I'm not going to be able to attribute this to everybody, uh, equip to everybody, but um, this is something I learned pretty early on. You know, we're, we're brought in to organizations to basically change the rate at which uh, change happens or results are oriented. And that's, that, that's an example and, and a, a definition of leadership. We change the rate at which organizations are able to accomplish something, and that can, you know, occur through a myriad of different uh, different ways. This is something that that I'm continually reminded of, and quite frankly, I, I live by this uh, every day. In Silicon Valley, you're only about as good as your last six months, and I and I I would venture to say that that's probably true at many places, but Silicon Valley is a unique place on the planet where. The rate at which companies succeed, fail, go out of business, merge, uh, you know, spin out, uh, spin in, is uh, probably you know unique in terms of uh, a square mileage place on the planet. And you are only as good as your last six months, and that's particularly poignant here at Google. Uh, maybe this goes uh, along with Nick Antonoprio's uh, statement, but. Um, you know, don't be a shameless self-promoter, and never believe your own PR. And that's something that you know we were we were actually talking about uh, uh, the whole Facebook announcement this morning, and there were a number of us trading emails on the way to work this morning. And you know, we were we were all you know we we're we're pretty proud of what we've accomplished. But you know, one of the statements that one of the senior guys sent out was, "Hey, you know, are we deluding ourselves, and are we believing our own PR?" Uh, and that led to some interesting uh, follow-on threads. Um, you know, this is, I, I had an opportunity to spend some time around Andy Grove in the early days of Intel, and, you know, I think this is a well-worn statement, but, it, but it's very, very true. Only the paranoid survive, and, you know, I think that, that this is something that, um, you know, you have to ask yourself, and you have to look at your company in a critical eye, and say, hey, you know, um, who is going to eat my lunch? Um, you know, it's very easy for us, quite frankly, to rationalize Facebook away. Uh, but I wake up every day thinking about Facebook and pretty much every night going to bed thinking about Facebook and other competitors. And I'm, I'm worried not only about the, com the competitors like Facebook that are out there and exist and are very vi visible, but, you know, there's a bazillion startups here in Silicon Valley, some of which are funded by or, or funded by ex-Googlers that have made a lot of money. And, you know, I'm also as much worried about the company that nobody knows about that's five guys operating in stealth mode down the street. Uh, but this is something that, that, you know, I think goes a long way. Um, if any of you have been around me or spent some time around me, uh, you know, I'm, there are probably multiple adjectives that people use for me, ADD, hyperactive. Uh, but one of the things that I love to do is, and every day I come to work and I bleed passion for what I do, um, you know. You know, I told my wife, uh, unfortunately, you know, we've been married for 20 years, so she knows what she bought and got into. But, you know, every day I pretty much wake up thinking about the work that I'm doing, and that could be Google, it could be renewable energy, it could be Cisco, whatever. Uh, and pretty much every night I go to bed that way. And, you know, uh, and I'm sometimes not proud of that fact, but uh, I'm very, very passionate about what I do. And that could be riding bikes, it could be, you know, whatever, racing cars, it could be going to work. But... Um, you know, I I love what I do, and quite frankly, if I didn't, and that's been one of the motivators for me to make the career changes that I have, then I student body left it and leave, uh, and go do something else that I am passionate about. I've heard this from multiple people, Angel, Jack Welsh, so I don't know who coined the phrase, but it is absolutely true. Hire A's because they hire A's. They know how to identify talent. B's hire C's, and C's hire morons, and I hate to be blunt and crass about that, but that is absolutely what I've seen. Uh, so the obvious uh, outcome of that is always hire A players. And, you know, the, the, the time for those of you that have managed people and managed performers, the time that you will spend managing a poor performer is two, three, four times the, the time that you will manage a high performer and it will drag, do nothing but drag you and the entire team down. So don't waste your time on it. Um, this actually came directly from Andy Grove one time. I was uh, in the middle of the whole Pentium debacle. This was back in 94, 95, I believe. I forget now. And uh, Andy, Andy was actually down at, at Chandler, and, and I stopped Andy and asked Andy one night late, late after work, 
So Andy, if you give me a piece of advice, being a new hire and a new uh, uh, Intel guy, um, what, what, what advice could you give me? And it was simple, make decisions. The rate at which companies succeed or fail is the rate at which they make decisions. And that's absolutely right, because that's the rate at which the balls move forward. And I think it's, it's spot on. Um, you know, for, for us MIT guys that, and, and women that love to use data, uh, I would assume that all models are wrong until proven otherwise. And the devil's in the detail and the devil's in the assumptions. And I learned that from uh, Charlie Fine and some others uh, very early on at uh, MIT, and I think it absolutely makes tons of sense. Um, <laughs> my job every day is, and I tell my folks is, to hopefully make your job simpler and uh, actually reduce complexity, not increase it. And uh, with a company that's grown like Google's has, that can be an interesting challenge. But um, you know, I think uh, it's starting to come out on, in TechCrunch uh, over the last 24 hours that, that Google and, and Larry's made some significant changes to reduce the complexity uh, within Google, and I think uh, you'll obviously see us continue to do that. But, you know, again, this is something that I can control with, well within my sphere of uh, influence and, and uh, domain within my own organization, pretty simply. You know, this is another issue. We get paid to look around the corner, and I was talking to Urs last night. We had a one-on-one. -on -one. And I was lamenting about with Doors about all the things that I don't know at Google, and you know he and I said, look, you know this is the biggest the biggest concern that I've got. Um, you know I can go build a bazillion servers and, and other gear and deploy it, but that point I made about in, being inextricably linked to the software platform without knowing the software, I can't anticipate, and I my intuition is blunted by not knowing how the software stack interacts with the hardware stack and. You know, I think that's a vignette of, as senior leaders, we get paid to look around the corners. We get paid to anticipate the the goofy things. You know, what happens if a earthquake hits Sendai or or somewhere in Japan, and it, you know, and and I'm getting rosy pictures from, from some of our suppliers that, quite frankly, I sniff bullshit. And you know, as we dig into their third, second, and third level supply chains, that in fact is true. And you know, you can only do that and get that intuition by really having the battle scars and that uh, knowledge. And But that's the whole intuition. That's what we get paid to go do and, and anticipate and think about not the next three months, that's management, but think about the next 18 to 24 months, that's in fact, I think, leadership. Um, this is, this is Andy, uh, so we're all adults here. A Andy basically said, results are everything, effort doesn't mean shit. Uh, and I was in an ops review once with Andy when he said that, and I think that that's absolutely spot on. I get into these conversations, even at Google, and it's like, guys, you know, thank you for the effort, but what are the results? What are you doing? What are we driving towards? Why are we doing this? And don't don't ever confuse means with the end, uh, because at the end of the day, it's the end that counts. Um, this is something that that I don't care what. You know, and, and you know, blame me perhaps for uh, I'll blame myself for for probably being too tactically focused at times. But you're always in the fight, and I think the, in the heat of the battle, you stop to step back, take a deep breath, look broader, and think strategically. And what I what I tend to do, and as, as practice is, I set dedicated time. I do two things. One is I look uh, at my week and go, Hey, was was I thinking strategically or was I kind of caught into this tactical morass, and and I set up dedicated time throughout the week to get away, get away from my office, get away from my you know my team, and just go park myself somebody in the somewhere in the Googleplex where nobody can find me, and just you know step back and say, okay, let's put this all into perspective. What are the things that we need to be doing? Are we on track? You know, are we developing people in the right way? Are we thinking about succession planning? Yada yada yada. Uh, but unless you do that, I think you get sucked down into the, the tactical issues and, and you, you um, that can lead to some uh, some bad places. This is something that, that I continually remind myself. So if you're going to hire a team that's better than you, know when the heck to get out of the way. And, you know, uh, don't become a crutch. You know, I throw my team into the mess and say, hey, look, I'm going to come back in, in, you know, 24 hours and see where you guys are. Don't come to me. Uh, if you can't solve the problem, then you know talk amongst yourself. You know talk to some other senior leaders. But I want to see how you guys are going to solve this problem, not not necessarily me. 
And, uh, you know, uh, that's culturally that can be interesting at times because, uh, you know, I inherited a team who at times who was looking for the answer. And uh, that's not what I'm here to do. I'll, I'll help, but I'm not here to be the, uh, the Wikipedia of Google. Um, this is something I learned from Larry just a few weeks ago, and I thought it was a very powerful, uh, uh, you know, we were talking about work structures and how to make decisions faster. And, and, you know, he said this, and I thought it was a pretty powerful statement. You know, people want to be led. They don't want to be managed. And, you know, do you push or do you pull? Um, and I think the, you know, you set an aspirational vision uh, with your team, you set some wild goals, and then you kind of shove them on their own. Uh, and I, and I, I actually love that. Um, somebody sent me some of these quips from Colin Powell. Uh, I, I got to know Colin a number of years ago, and uh, the guy's a phenomenal guy. Um, you know, perpet perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. And, you know, obviously that's, that's military speak, but um, I actually think that, you know, my job is to be at times the biggest cheerleader in the world, even when I go home and go, oh, God, I don't know how we're going to solve this problem. But, you know, I, I, never, bull I never BS my folks. I, I am about as transparent as you can be. Sometimes when I'm in all hands giving and I'm talking about some of the challenges, my leadership team is sitting in the front row cringing because I'm, I am so blunt and transparent with my folks. But look, we're all adults and uh, we want to be treated that way. But um, I do believe that, you know, um, in the face of, uh, of extreme odds sometimes, you've got to be out there being in front, being a cheerleader. I love this. I won't, you guys can read this as well as I can. Um, but, uh, you know, another Colin Powellism that, that I think is actually both entertaining and spot on. And, uh, you know, I guess this goes with check your ego at the door. We've talked about that already. Uh, Lee Scott over at Walmart uh, said this. Um, this is something that, quite frankly, I live with every day, and I suspect most of you do too. Um, you know, you're always wondering, God, am I on top of everything? What's going to happen? And uh, maybe fear of failure is a great motivator from a... Uh, uh, standpoint. Okay, I'm going to switch gears now and talk about career management, and this is probably going to be uh, a little less uh, 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 time intensive, but this is just some of the things that I've seen and tried to manage my career. So I'm a passionate guy. Every career decision I've made has been driven by, not by title, um, not by pay, but um, um, uh, but by, hey, am I having a great time? And is this fun? Um, you know, this this is a uh, another um, uh, this is another one. Um, you got to get out of your comfort zone if you want to grow. You actually have to force yourself out of your comfort zone. And I continually do this with my team. I'll put them in jobs where I think they're good uh, and they've got some skill sets, but they haven't demonstrated greatness yet. And uh, there's no better way than develop um, than to do this. I, I tell this to a lot of people I mentor. You know, who, who's on your board of advisors? Who can you go um, and really uh, get advice from? And who, you know, in an objective way that'll really be honest and tell you if you're screwing up. Uh, and you know, I, I I have this. It's kind of scattered across the valley, but. Um, you know, I have people that uh, that help me out and have helped me out quite a bit in my career. And, uh, you know, from all, probably all walks of life, but, uh, you know, I think about that a lot. Um, this is something that I tell people. So if you want to grow and develop quickly, uh, you've got to go to a growth company and you or, or an area in your company that's growing. Um, and, you know, with complete respect to, to all organizations and, and industry sectors on the call, um, you know, it's tough to tough to grow yourself, in my opinion, when your company is going through continual shrinkage. Uh, the challenges are obviously very different. They can be, and I've done this too, they can be incredibly uh, uh, developmental. But if you really want to turbocharge your career, you really have to go to a growth area. Um, because they're not, you know, uh, you tend to go to stagnant and low growth companies and the battles become about turf and philosophy and and uh, stuff that doesn't move the organization forward rather than growing and developing a business. So I know that, that might be a bit controversial, but uh, uh, but I think it's something that's very, very important. And then 
I think you've got to always understand and map what you do directly to the balance sheet and or the, the P&L. Really to understand, am I driving true change and, and effectual change within the organization? And, and how do we impact, myself, my group, how does it impact the business? Um, always know what you're thinking about. Are you, is this a tactical decision or, or strategic thinking? And how are you acting? And, you know, I tend to, you know, I tend to look at my calendar again and go, do I need to be in all these meetings? Am I adding value? And, uh, and I'll occasionally walk into a meeting and look around and go, there's no way I'm going to add value to this meeting, guys. I need the hour to do something else. See ya. Thanks. Um, this is something that, quite frankly, I've lived by. Get a brand. Be different. Be known for something. And I think that, that you know, for those of you that are leaving LFM right now, LFM teaches you how to learn. Uh, all the skills and everything that I learned in 93 are pretty much, you know, other than Little's Law and some queuing theory math <laughs> and macro and microeconomic theory has pretty much been replaced. The Internet for all, for the, for the Internet and the World Wide Web didn't, for the most part, even exist as we know it today in 93. And I look at the job that I do, my, you know, Google didn't exist. Uh, the job that I'm doing pretty much didn't exist in the way that, that we're shaping it because the technology and, and bandwidth wasn't there. Um, this, you know, be a systems thinker. I think this is the thing that makes Sloanies incredibly and in LGOs and LFMs particularly valuable. We think like systems thinkers. And to this day, and I've worked with Stanford and Harvard and MIT and Northwestern, and the list goes on and on. The, the unique and beautiful thing about an MIT education is, and a Sloan education is, I think it teaches you to think systemically, and there aren't many B-School programs, and certainly no programs like LGO out there that, that really allow you to do this. Um, this is something that I learned early on. When I started at, at Intel, uh, I, and I will be the first to admit, I moaned and groaned about it, but I worked the night shift and uh, you know ran uh, production for a fairly sizable operation. and. It was, I wouldn't say a crappy job, but it was um, not exactly perhaps what I expected as my first job out of LFM. And uh, not only being a, a nice comeuppance, but it was a great way to learn the business because I wasn't encumbered by a lot of meetings. I had opportunities to dig into the, uh, the real world. Um, this probably goes without saying, but most companies have a formal and informal power structure, know how it works, and use it to your advantage. Um, this is something I learned from Andy. My wife continually uses it on me day in and day out. You see a problem, you own it. You know, don't don't stand around in the scrum and look and see who's going to pick up the ball. Just pick it up. Um, you know, that's that's leadership. And you, this is a well-worn and tried and true statement. But for a lot of people in their career development, I mentor a lot of people that I would say are completely focused on getting to point B. And, you know, I'm going to get to that next promotion. I'm going to get that next pay raise. Life is going to be great. My peers are going to love me. I'm going to consider that to be an accomplishment. And there's a corollary to that. The point, point B euphoria is, has a half-life that is very, very short. And the higher you go up, I will contend, the shorter it is. Um, you know, I am extremely grateful and proud of, of you know, of, uh, getting this job at Google, <laughs> the euphoria lasted about 24 hours because I realized what a big job it is. And that's not to say I don't have work, fun and, and going to work every day, but at the same time, um, the you know, I, you know, uh, my boss was asking me last night, so where do you want to go at Google? And I told him, look, Urs, I I want to do nothing but succeed in the job that I'm in today, and I'll worry about. Next, the next job or the next uh, scope uh, in the future. That's not something I wake up and even think about. Uh, we have got such a huge job here to do right now that, um, and, and you know, I'm 47, that, that probably comes with a little bit of, of you know, maturation and, and quite frankly, you know, motivations about coming to work every day change significantly as you get into your career uh, for some people. So, um, you know, but again, don't don't manage your career, manage the, the journey, and and all it'll all work out in the end. Um, so uh, you know, and stay focused on the problems, not the symptoms. I, I was in a meeting last night, perfect example, and I'm sitting here looking around the room, going, guys, we're not solving the right problem. We're solving all the symptoms of the higher order problem. Let's get the higher order problem out on the table, and I think that'll that'll fall in line. Okay, so that's kind of the. 
Uh, that's kind of the formal part. I've got one slide on Google Trivia just for purely entertainment factor, and then we can go into Q&A. Um, so, uh, and sorry, this works in a, in a much better, uh, works much better in an interactive crowd, but, but for those of you that don't know, Google, you know, Google is now, has now become a verb, a noun, uh, in some type, type uh, even a verb or an adverb, an adjective. Um, that was actually not the name of the, uh, the first uh, search engine. Uh, the original name was actually Backrub, and uh, I can't imagine, you know, saying, well, just go back rub it. Uh, that doesn't have the same panache, but uh, fortunately, uh, Larry and Sergey came up with Google, and the name has stuck ever since. Um, this next person is actually a, fr uh, a friend of mine who wrote the first check for Google, and um, he is actually uh, a very, very interesting character. I've had the pleasure of working with him at, Go at now Google, but also when I was at Cisco, uh, I manufactured all of his products in the mid-range, and, and uh, Andy Bechtelsheim uh, is now the CEO of a company called Arrestor Networks. Uh, Andy co-founded Sun, and he is a uh, very, very interesting character, but he actually wrote the first check uh, for $100,000 to Larry and Sergey to found Google, and uh, that equity um, uh, was worth a billion dollars, uh, so that's a, a nice ROI for Andy on that one. And uh, I suspect Andy probably didn't need that additional billion anyway, but good for Andy. Um, there is a button on Google Search. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. I'm feeling lucky. What percentage of Google searches go through it? About 1%, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting uh, because most of my searches when I go to Google are very, very directed. So I, quite frankly, was uh, surprised to find it even that high. And then, you know, what what day of the year did Google Gmail launch? Uh, we actually launched it on April 1st, and um, uh, people thought it was an April Fool's joke, <laughs> but it turned out to be um, the largest uh, uh, email instance on the planet. A lot of companies, uh, including ours, run their company on it now. And interestingly enough, we last, just a few days ago, for April 1st, we our April Fool's joke was we... Um, we announced a product to control Gmail by uh, uh, by uh, kinetics or, or uh, you know people hand waving and doing things with their hands. And lo and behold, somebody actually not at Google, but somebody uh, took their uh, Xbox Connect and they actually built a product to do just that. So I guess now you can find our April Fool's joke instantiated in a uh, Connect uh, hack. Uh, so. You know, and then uh, if you guys are around Mountain View or, or Silicon Valley, uh, there's this, um, we have a herd of goats, <laughs> and they're the Google goats, and we've got a lot of land uh, here at Google, and we've actually hired these goats, or, or in some cases bought these goats, to actually feed on, instead of, you know, mowing these acres of, uh, and acres of, of lawn, we actually have our own goats that... Um, that you'll see on the, the hillside. And in fact, we got a goat last year to uh, call in to uh, one of our, uh, thank God it's Friday, uh, we, have, we have a beer bash every Friday night. And one of the Google goats actually called in on the VC and asked Larry Page a question, which was uh, absolutely a riot. I think it's out on YouTube. And uh, anyway, so we've got, uh, we've got our own herd of goats that, that feed around the Google headquarters, which is, uh, and by the way, just another uh, uh, little side note, uh, our Googleplex is actually um, completely off the grid uh, through a combination of balloon boxes and solar panels on the roofs of the Googleplex. Um, we actually um, run it independent of PG&E. Uh, so we, we actually are, again, uh, very active in the whole renewable energy space. So that's it. And, you know, with that, I'll, I'll, I think we've got 10 minutes, and you can ask a, a myriad of different questions, and I'll, I'll try to ask or answer them where I can. Jim, thank you so much. Um, I've got a bunch of questions in the queue. I, I think probably some people have been sending them to you in chat also. Um, so you could look in your chat. I'm just going to start off to make sure that uh, we get some Q&A, uh, some questions from our current LGO students. So let me put one out there from one of the LGO students asks you, um, I wonder what advice you could give us in terms of looking for your first job after LGO. This is from a current first year student. Can we pigeonhole ourselves, and how do we keep ourselves hireable? Yes. 
Uh, great question. So I, yeah, I still, uh, I mentor a lot of folks here in the Valley uh, that are leaving Stanford and MIT folks. You will spend, in retrospect, and this is all in retrospect, guys, so I was there, I lived it, I remember that, that pain and agony of, of you know, laying in bed at one in the morning thinking about, my God, I'm making the biggest decision of my life. Believe it or not, no matter how much angst you're putting into this decision, I don't believe that it is as big as you're making it out to be. Now, that said, it also is a very important decision, though, because uh, I think that it, it will instill values and culture that will stick with you throughout through your career. And, you know, uh, Jeff Wilkie and I are good friends, and, and I think uh, when I look at Jeff's career, uh, you know, at Amazon, and, and having worked with Jeff in the early days of Amazon, I think about the Jeff that I knew at LGO and the Jeff that I knew at Amazon, and, uh, you know, he was shaped, molded by Allied. Uh, and his days at Allied before it became Honeywell. And he brought a lot of that discipline and a lot of that process focus to Amazon, which, so, you know, it is important, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it is important from a culture and value standpoint. And what I tell people is focus on the values and the culture piece. Don't focus as much on the role. The role won't matter as much as, um, the value and the culture of the company that you're going to. So with, for the sake of time, I'll cut it off there. Next question. I'm not on WebEx, so Josh, I can't see without going through and logging back onto Chrome, and I, I'm not going to do that. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got another question from one of the students who's here with us now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, uh, another question is, is there a limit on the number of companies you can work for? Um, have you been negatively perceived by what could be seen as jumping jobs, or is it recognized and accepted in Silicon Valley? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. Um, I was sitting next to the CEO of UPS uh, a number of years ago, and he basically, this was before, I was at Cisco, and I, you know, I described my career as, you know, my post-LFM career up to that was Intel, to uh, Teledesic, where I spent a year, to Amazon, to Cisco, and he called me a job jumper then. I thought it was interesting. Uh, I guess it's all perspective, you know? I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, we could debate that till the cows come home. You know, to be perfectly honest, uh, you know, I left Cisco for what I thought would be a long career at First Solar, and, and I'll, you know, I won't go into a lot of detail on this for the sake of time, but, you know, uh, you know, to cut through all the the the, the BS and, and the, the PR around, uh, you know, I went to First Solar, and, and I'll be perfectly honest, I didn't like it. Uh, it. It was not a cultural fit for me, and I'll leave it at that. And I negotiated uh, a package to leave the company, and um, you know, it was just one of those things where hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, my wife and I both kind of laugh and go, "Oh God, you know, how did we ever get into that situation?" And I came back to Silicon Valley and didn't know what I wanted to do. And my wife requested that I take some time off because I've been working crazy hours. So I started a consulting firm. And then I was at a consulting firm. And like most consultants, I got hired by one of my clients, Sanmina. And the day I started at Sanmina, Google called. And, you know, I was very respectful to uh, Sanmina and, and, you know, didn't, I actually did not return the Google call for two months. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's very difficult to turn down Google in a role like this. Uh, so, yeah, I would say that the last three years of my career probably have not, have been probably a little bit of job jumping, driven probably more by the situation. Um, you know, but, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, quite frankly, and, and sorry, this is going to sound rather crass, I don't really give a shit what people think. I mean, you know, I've gotten to a point in my life, in my career, and I guess even financial security where it really doesn't matter. So, you know, you do, life's too short. Um, you know, I go to work every day because, you know, for me it's a fulfillment of uh, what I love doing, and I don't manage by what other people think. Uh, and, you know, I'm very proud of the things that I've accomplished, and, and so be it. 
And hopefully, that, that's not meant to be an arrogant statement. I, I'm not an arrogant person, I don't think. And But it's just the way that I've managed my career. My career has been managed by, do I wake up and do I love going to work? You know, and, and you know, everybody has bad days. I had bad days here at, at Google. But, you know, you know, my acid test is pretty simple. It's, you know, am I passionate? Am I having fun? Am I making good money? Do I love the people that I work with? And am I inspired by the company and its culture? And, um, you know, that, and I take those, those very seriously. And, um, you know, that's pretty much how I've managed my career. Okay. Um, another question, uh, which is very relevant for LGO and LSM grads. What are the keys to being able to switch industries? Particularly the higher in your position, the harder it is to convince employers you're qualified for the job because you don't have specific experience in that space. Even though you might know you have the basic tools, what you referred to earlier as the ability to learn instilled in a place like LGO. Well, I mean, look, guys, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, you know, as much as I'd love to see myself someday running the global operations for, for Porsche, <laughs> and I say that kind of tongue in cheek, um, I'm not an auto guy. And, you know, I, you get to a point in your life where you are. Uh, you're, I, I'm not a biotech guy. Uh, I couldn't do, I look at some of the things that my co-workers do at, at Boeing, for example, and I wouldn't be, you know, uh, a successful, you know, uh, senior executive in operations at Boeing, I, I don't believe. Um, so you, you kind of define your space and, you know, so be it. Uh, I think, again, it's it's about you got to be passionate in what you do. I mean, I, you know, I am, I find uh, bio, you know, uh, biochemistry and biology extremely interesting, but I couldn't go to work every day and do biochemistry. It wouldn't, it wouldn't, I wouldn't find it interesting. So, you know, again, it, it's about, um, and I, I'm not sure I've got a great answer, but, you know, it's ironic because you do see the very senior folks switch industries. Uh, I find, you know, uh, you know, uh, Mulally goes from being at Boeing to Ford. Uh, McNerney goes from being at GE to uh, uh, Boeing, 3M. Uh, you know, so, you know, I find it, find it interesting at the very, very senior level that's not true, but when you get into these operational roles, it is more important to be domain-specific. And, uh, you know, I, I think that that there are very, very, for my career, there's very, very common threads that run through that. Energy, uh, you know, a data center basically is a huge box. You stick in power and, and cooling water in one end, and out comes heat and, and bits out of the other. Uh, and in its essence, that's about as simple as it gets. And that's, you know, whether you're working in IT or working on, on renewable energy, those are both very, very salient uh, or, or uh, applicable domains. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that one. Yeah, any other questions? Um, you know, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, we, we had a couple of people asking about specific technical matters, but it seems like that's not really the thrust of this conversation, which has been so helpful uh, to us and the audience in terms of your perspective on life after LFM and, and life in an operations leadership role. So. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for participating. We had 100 plus people on the call. This is this uh, the recording of this call uh, will be made available on the LGO Tech TV collection. Um, send me an email if you have problems finding that, but you can just search MIT Tech TV for the LGO collection. That should be posted by next week. So you, um, thank you again. You'll of course bleep out the cuss words, right? Oh yeah, that's easy to do. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, thanks everyone and have a great day. Thank you.